Well, how did your week go with the challenge of setting your mind on the things of God as opposed to the chaos of the world? I wonder, did you find peace? And today we're going to focus on that very idea. And really, there's a, probably a three or four month study that it would take to really dive into peace. But today we're going to focus, uh, and this concept is one of those concepts that is a challenge to live out. And it reminds me, though, of back in 1993, I was 20 years old, and I found myself in a land that was full of chaos. It was in the country of Somalia. I was 20 years old in the Marine Corps, and we landed, and I was geared up and ready to go and help bring peace to this country. Well, hope is really what we hope to do through peace. In fact, the country was full of chaos in a way that some didn't understand. By the end of 90, 1992, they estimated that over 350,000 people would have be dying from starvation and from uh, different diseases that were in that area. And so we came in, and the chaos that ensued was riots. It was anarchy. There were uh, tribal leaders who wanted to have leadership over the country. And so we were called in, and in the middle of that, we saw destruction, we saw fighting and looting, and I found myself in a unique position. So my job there was to help bring peace to Restore Hope, Operation Restore Hope. And I had flak jackets and helmets, and we had all kinds of ammunition and weapons, and that was our job to be there to, by force, bring peace. But I found myself in an interesting place. One morning I woke up to the sound of the bombing happening in the distance. And so I, I crawled out of my sleeping bag and went and stood. And in this kind of eerie moment, a far enough in the distance that I knew I was safe, I wasn't scared about where I stood in relation to this, this bomb. <laughs> but I found myself torn because in front of me I watched destruction and death and chaos. And where I stood, I was surrounded by safe and peaceful surroundings. But inside the, my heart, deep in me, there was turmoil. And it was a time when God began to wrestle with me about who I was and what was my purpose in life and what was my calling in my life. But it was a marker where I remember very clearly I was caught between two worlds. The world of chaos, surrounded by peace, but turmoil inside. And today, if you'll join me in, we're going to look at Colossians. Because what I realized is that there cannot be peace inside just because there's peace around. Let me say it this way. If you think you can control the outside peace, it does not guarantee you will have inner peace. Controlling the outside does not guarantee inner peace. And so as we look at our scripture, let's take a look and see what the Apostle Paul has to say about peace. And I want to remind you, we've been walking through the book of Colossians, and chapters 1 and 2 really are setting up the stage for this conversation today. And even last week, as Pastor Paul talked through the first part of chapter 3, I had to ask him, hold off, don't get into the topic of peace yet. There's too much to cover. And so he set us up about where we set our mind. And so as we look at the Scripture... I want you to keep the reminder, everything that has been set up for today is about the gospel of Jesus Christ and what his role is and what he did for us as a bringer of peace. So let's read together in Colossians chapter 3, uh, follow along, verse 15 is where I'll be reading from. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You see, we live in a world that is full of people desiring peace. But I don't know about you, it feels very chaotic right now. And uh, I think if we were to give this message 
uh, a year and a half ago, it may not sink in at the level that it perhaps will today because there is a lot of unrest. And so our first responsibility or our first response in this is really that we need to receive peace. We need to receive it. And so we ask that question, how do I receive peace? The answer is, we can't manufacture it because it's a gift. And the world will hear this. If you aren't a believer of Christ yet, you might hear this and go, wait a minute, I, I've found myself to find peace through lots of ways. Well, back in the 60s, for those of you who are children of peace, you rem- might remember some of the symbolism of that era. And it carries on to today, right? Peace. And this imagery of we really want to have peace. And unfortunately, some of those became violent areas in the desire for peace. But what I want to do is present to you a different symbol. A symbol that oftentimes you may not think about as the symbol of peace. And it's the cross. You see, peace is attainable because of the work of the cross. So to receive peace is a gift that we receive from God and it flows out of the gospel. And we've been spending a lot of time in Colossians looking at the gospel of Jesus and how what he accomplished on the cross allowed us to receive peace with God and from God. First, let's talk about from God. Take a look, if we go back for a minute into Colossians, uh, back in chapter 1, it said this, For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, Jesus, and through him, Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus came to fulfill a sacrifice requirement which allowed you and me to receive peace with God. No longer did we have to have separation. The blood that was shed opened a way and it's a powerful image when you think about this gift is not something i can do (laughs) it is something i have to receive so through the surrender and the understanding we are told if you put your faith in christ you can receive a gift of salvation but that gift of salvation is more it's peace with god it's a restored relationship that we receive so have you found peace is a question before we go forward. If you call yourself a follower of Christ already where you've put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, then you've been given a spirit of peace. The Holy Spirit dwells in you, this gift that you receive. And if you have not done that yet, this is a time to really consider what does that mean for you? And I would challenge you if you're watching at home or wherever you're watching, that today would be a time where you evaluate Have I really found peace? Or have I been trying to manufacture it? It's available to you. The second part that we see is that we receive peace with God. And ultimately, as I said earlier, this is through faith. So as as the Spirit comes to dwell in us, once we surrender our life, we now get this power within us to help us work with God and be with God in peace no longer separated, in unity with God, no longer an enemy, but now a child of God. These are amazing gifts when you start to realize that now I can live in peace. I am no longer an enemy of God. I don't know about you, but if you've ever had an enemy, it's real hard to want to sit down and get along and have a cup of coffee. It's hard to want to be in proximity with an enemy. And we were called enemies of God. But take a look. I'm going to read this to you from Colossians 3. Listen to what it says about how we get to work now with the Spirit and with, with Christ. It says this. It says, Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Remember, this is from last week a little bit. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on earthly, th- earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. 
You are now hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. The beautiful part of when we receive peace is that we no longer try on our own to manufacture it. Peace lives within us, and now our responsibility is how can we work with God to develop peace internally so that we can impact peace externally. We now get peace internally. No longer do I have to try to manufacture it out here because it doesn't work anyways. I can't tell you the number of times I've found myself thinking about what could I do to change the world around me so that I could have peace. And so sometimes I'll go and uh, maybe go on a hike and I'll go out in the woods and just get away from the world. And it's awesome. And I find a temporary amount of solitude with some silence and a little bit of peace. And then I return to the chaos of the world. And very quickly, that little external exercise can be void, (laughs) void of any peace. But I want to tell you, I woke up recently and I really have struggled to find peace. I I have uh, allowed myself into a habit that I am not happy about. And for 10 years, I avoided, and it was called the news. And you know, I watched the news uh, 10 years ago, and I just was fed up. Couldn't do it anymore. So I took a, a little fasting break, or almost 10 years. And this year, I got caught up in election Uh, mess of elections. I got caught up in COVID information. I got caught up in all these things. And several weeks ago, I found myself (laughs) in great turmoil. I think it's, it's interesting because what it felt like was, one, that I was agitated all the time. Two, I felt like I had to judge everybody. I was judging people for where do they stand on this and how do they feel about that. And then another real problem with this came up is that I felt like I was in competition with others. Well, if I'm agitated, feeling in competition and judging others, it's really hard to find peace. And it was, uh, I think this is one of those moments where God said, uh, you know, knock, knock, knock. Hey, how you doing? And I was like, eh, I'm all right. I'm kind of agitated and kind of frustrated with humanity and really just want to get out of here. What can we do? And he says, well, guess what? Why don't you set your mind on me? And he was right. You see, the peace was in me and desiring to be out of me, but I was stifling it by blocking the Spirit working through me. And I'll tell you, I was so frustrated. And then, as I began to look at God's Word, and I began to focus on the things of God, and I began to turn off the radio and get away from the chat room, and for me personally, turn off Facebook, those things began to be distant. And I began to find peace again. And I think that, and I hope that, if my family noticed it, <laughs> I certainly felt it. But I realized that that peace was desiring to get out. Because our world desires to see peace. And it really reminded me of this spiritual pathway. We've been talking a lot about this. But oftentimes, we would talk about the gospel, and we would think about the first, uh, the first thing I said about that we receive peace. The gospel is that the work on the cross is that Jesus died for our sins and made a way for us to have relationship again and no longer be enemies with God. And so we think about that moment right here. But then I realize that no matter where I am in my journey of following with God, every morning I have to seek peace again. Because man, my flesh, it cries out. (laughs) It wants to get out. It wants to destroy. Uh, My flesh, personally, I just love to have everything go my way. I like to have people in my sphere of influence that that I agree with. I don't want any arguments. I want it to be peaceful. And the more I control that, the better off I am. And so I have to remind myself all along the journey, no matter who you are and where you are or how long you've been walking with God, you're gonna have to seek peace every day. It's not just a one-time peace that you receive. This is a daily journey. And so, the outpouring of that was this. I have received peace. I have worked on finding peace again every day. But then I'm also reminded that it's my responsibility to make peace. 
You say, make peace. How, how does that work? I thought you just said this is through faith and this is a work of God and in, in the Spirit within me is what helps bring peace into me and then at, flows out of me is what the Spirit does to bring peace to the world. And you're absolutely right, but I still have a responsibility. Let's take a look at what it says here. If we go back to Colossians 3.15, it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. And Pastor Ed pointed this out the other day. He says this, slow down. That's good advice when you read Scripture. I'm afraid I jump oftentimes into what I think God is saying because I've read it before or I've heard it, and I miss what He's actually trying to say. But Pastor Ed said this, look at that word let. Let the peace. There's a submissive, submissive action here. See, I have a choice right now, and I have a choice in the morning. Will I pursue peace or will I pursue chaos? I do have a choice. The spirit in me desires peace. <laughs> the flesh in me, I don't know why it desires sort of almost chaotic behavior. And so I have a choice. And the choice is to let the peace of Christ, that truth of Christ, to follow and submit. But there are ways that we make false peace. See, in our effort to make peace, here are some things that we tend to do. For one, we avoid. Rather than talking to people, rather than working out differences, rather than having good debate and good dialogue, we avoid people in the workplace, in the home, at church, wherever it is, because they have a difference that I don't agree with. They've hurt me in a way that it hurt. <laughs> They've said things that damaged. And so to keep peace, I'll avoid them. There's a problem with avoidance. It's false peace. For one, they may not even know how much turmoil you're going through because of the interaction with them. And two, every time you see them, it just stirs up that emotion. And three, you never deal with it. So it piles and it piles. And then everything they say piles on top of that. Avoidance is not a way to make peace. It's false peace. Another one is control or manipulation. See, this is the area where we often say, do what I want and I will be at peace. Right? You do what I say, you follow my regulations, you agree with how I speak, as long as everybody does that and I can control the room, then I'll have peace. <laughs> I'll be at great peace. You'll be at turmoil, but I'll be in great peace. And so I control, and we see this in our families. In fact, I'm not going to have time to get into the last part of chapter 3, so I encourage you, because this is one of those books that often is left open on the nightstand, right? Husbands, wives, you know, the elbow. Husband. We should read that. Or wife, I'll just leave it on the nightstand hoping she reads it because I want to be at peace ultimately. She needs to submit to me and husbands, you need to love me better and kids, you need to obey. All these pieces come up and we realize those are all aspects of control if they're not an outpouring of submission and peace. They're ways we try to control people. Read this text, honey. <laughs> See how it says to submit to me? Yeah, that's how I'm going to find peace. It'll be much better. Well, maybe you can read some more of that on your own and kind of dive in. But do it through the filter of the gospel first. Do it through the filter of what it means to have peace. And then look at yourself first. If you're a husband or a male, what does it mean to love a woman or your wife the way Christ loved the church? Ugh, I don't like that verse. Yeah, me either. Get over it. It's okay. The third way that I think we try to make fall false peace or manufacture peace is through consumption. And this has become a really big issue. Um, it's never gone away. It's been around since the dawn of time, I'm sure of it. But this idea of numbing the world around me will give me peace. And so it starts with a simple glass of beer, a glass of wine, and you feel relaxed. And two years later, it's a half a case of beer and two bottles of wine and 
Every day you can't wait to get home because what you thought you found is peace. The same is true through drugs or food consumption. Guilty. I'm guilty of that one. I just, when I want peace, I just want to eat. I want to eat peace. <laughs> I want to eat my feelings. Some of it is travel just to get away. If I can just escape this and I'll go here and go there and I just keep really busy that I don't have to deal and I feel more at peace. And for some of you, shopping and spending money, purchasing items, there's, you know, the list goes on and on. Just think about for yourself, what is it in your life that you do to, to manufacture peace that you know at the deep root, once the high is wore off, the fixation on the object, the purchase is complete, you realize you're right back where you started in search of more peace. But there is genuine peace that can be found. And it was extended to you through Christ when He reconciled you. When when you surrendered your life and He reconciled a relationship, He brought restoration to a relationship with God through Him the same is true that we, our call is to extend that to others. Reconciliation is the activity <laughs> of making peace with others even when it's difficult. And so I have a kind of a story that I'm sort of embarrassed by, but it's, it's me. <laughs> and the problem with me is that I'm sinful. And I hate that about me. And uh, I've been on staff for 10 years now. And about two years ago, I came to a place where I had to confront some of my poor handling of reconciliation. And there was somebody on staff that for eight years we served together. And uh, we worked in a lot of different capacities. And every time we did something together, sometimes I felt talked down to. And that created tension. And I didn't feel peace around that person. And, and then we were doing some stuff with worship training and, and I wasn't good enough. And I just I felt like, just unworthy of anything and the words that were said were harsh and and they felt critical and so I bottled that up and I didn't address it and and then uh, down the road we kind of went and there was it felt like I was left to do a lot of cleanup and I didn't address it and then we had a conversation one early early on in our in our kind of getting to know each other and I just felt like wow those words are really harsh I don't even know you and you're kind of like attacking me yeah even in church settings humans exist and on staff i had to sit down with this guy and it was pastor will it was a tough day see pastor will and i sat down and it wasn't what he had done it was what i had not done that was the bigger issue sure the things that that i felt were true and real but the way i responded was was not right And so we talked and I confessed that I had held these things against him. And we actually reached a point in the conversation and I said, look, if we can't come to to peace and unity, then one of us, mainly me, one of us will have to go. I can't serve if we can't find peace together. I don't think it's right. And I'm grateful. And and thank you, Pastor Will. Thank you that uh, for one, it hurt him to hear these things. So don't think that it was like he was cheering all the way through this. It hurt. And it took a while for him to rebuild trust in me because what I had done is hide from him. I avoided him. I used the avoidance tactic. But I'm grateful that there's restoration happening. And today we can sit in great peace and unity to serve together. But it's not easy. Reconciliation is difficult avoidance is easy right numbing is easy controlling is easy and what jesus did was not easy in romans 12 18 if you're familiar with that passage it tells us if it is possible as far as it depends on you live at peace with everyone and that's the heartbeat that was going on in my heart because I was not living that out. So how's your peace? We're going to actually be uh, stepping forward here into a new sermon series. This is such a, an important topic in, in the church and in church unity that we're going to be talking about this in a sermon series in a few weeks. See, we are, have never probably been, at least in my life, at such a 
an area of conflict. There is conflict potential all around. Whether it's vaccine or no vaccine, mask or no mask, what political party, impeach or not impeach, wall or no wall, I can go on. We could spend a whole day just listing the potential for conflict. And we've been called to something greater. Not that those things aren't important and not that we shouldn't clearly understand them, but they really get in the way of a greater mission and a greater purpose. And that is to share peace. We go on because it says this. I love, this is the next passage. Right after 15 comes 16. Go get it, yeah. It says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Last time it said, remember that? Let. Now, if we're going to let peace, also let the message of Christ, again the Gospel, let it dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. See, as you're doing this, as you find peace, this is the outpouring of that. You can begin to sing these songs. You can be in unity. If you continually let that message of Christ dwell in you, you can continue to live in peace and have peace with others and make peace with others as the Spirit works through you. And it's an awesome experience. And it's not perfect every day because we're sinful humans, but that's the goal. But the outpouring of that ultimately is that we would share peace. It's not just for me as much as I love it. Because if I found and received peace and kept it to myself, what's the point? Yeah, I live in peace, but then I have to isolate from everybody else to stay there. Then I'm told to make peace. So now as peace dwells in you, make it with others. Keep that unity specifically in this to the body of Christ. Because the world's looking, they want to see what does it look like to have peace with one another. And then finally, we're to share peace. Remember I said the world is in chaos. People are desperate for peace. And some of them try to find it in violent ways to get people's attention. Don't you understand? We want peace. I don't understand how violence leads to that, but whatever. That's the approach that we see all around us. They try to control what they can't control, but they don't receive what's available to them. So our job is to take the message of Christ, which is the path to peace. Look what it says here. Verse uh, 17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So just to make it real clear, you might circle this if you have your Bible, or you might write this down, or you might point to it. I underlined word and deed. We're going to talk about that for a second. But if you want the, the real snapshot, super easy version, it says whatever you do. Not in some of the things you do, not in a couple things. It's very clear. Whatever, whatever you do, do it all in the name of Lord Jesus so that you can bring peace and the message of peace. But the first one is word. Your words need to bring peace. So, how are your words? I, I got to tell you, I'm going to just be real transparent for a moment. The year 2020, the COVID craziness, everything that has gone on between political views, I have been more uh, hurt personally and saddened by the body of Christ in the words that have been used. In fact, part of the reason I had to shut down Facebook was because every day I opened it, it, just, it was just painful. I, I don't understand how we can live in a world where we, I think we've, somehow disassociated my verbal word from my social media platform. It's as if I think when I'm in person, I should talk of peace and allow the Spirit to talk through me. But my social media platform is my free reign, do whatever you want platform. Say whatever you want, it doesn't matter. I'm here to tell you it's your word whether it's a text or a phone call message, whatever it is, it is your word and it matters. And so the question is, are you a bringer of peace or a taker of peace in your word? 
do your words bring peace into the situation or do they steal it away from the environment? It's been really hard. I wish I, wish I could say that being in ministry during COVID season was like the highlight of, of my life. <laughs> and it is in one way. That is that I get to have peace <laughs> and share peace with others. But it has been very difficult. The second one I want you to think about are your deeds. To sum it up very simply, whatever you do. <laughs> what are your deeds? Whatever you do. When you go to the gas station and you're late, how's your deed? What do you say and how do you behave? When you walk into the kitchen, a friend of mine said he knew how his dad was going to be by the slamming of the cupboards in the kitchen as soon as he arrived. That set the tone for the night. So when you enter the room, how are people responding by your entrance? Do you bring peace or destroy? Are you a peacemaker or a peace taker? I love this passage. I just felt like I needed to finish here. It comes from Isaiah 26. It says, you, referring to God, will keep in perfect peace. I want that so bad. I want perfect peace. I want perfection and peace. I want balance and unity all around me. That's what I desire. But God will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. They're focused on the things of God because they trust in you. Peace comes in trusting in Jesus. 23 years later, I returned to Africa. This time was different. See, I went in with the armor of God, not the armor of the military. And as Scripture says, I had my feet fitted with peace of the Gospel. I was ready. And our purpose there was to go to establish what kind of mission work we could do in this region. What could we do to help advance the gospel to bring peace into a Muslim nation. And I was confronted with the moment. You see, at 3 o'clock on Fridays, all around the world, the mosques are released. Men come out of the mosque, and they're in their finest attire for the service, but oftentimes they come out ready for battle. And in this particular area, on this particular street, um, a week prior to my arrival, the men of the mosque came out, not when I was there the week prior, they came out ready for destruction. You see, there was a trial, and they didn't like the murder trial the way it was going, and so they grabbed the machetes, took matters in their own hands, and they chopped into pieces the man that was accused. And there I am a week later on the same street, and I'm on a doorstep of a man named Abdurman. And Abdurman went off into the mosque for the service, for the rally, whatever you want to call it. And there I stood at 3 o'clock and I heard from the minarets the release. And here came 500 Muslim men walking down the street. And I got to tell you, I was a little concerned for a moment. You see, I was Christian, a white male, and the only one in town. And I can't help but wonder, in my head, I was, for a brief moment, I thought, well, how's my peace today? Because I can't control the outside. All I can say is that there was something going on inside. And I stood there, and I have to tell you, I achieved, not me, the spirit in me, achieved perfect peace. I can't explain it until you've experienced that idea of perfect peace where I stood and I thought, okay, God, whatever you have today, it's your day. And the men came by, and I have to say, they talked and smiled, and it was, <laughs> it was a good outcome. Praise God for that. I'm here to tell you about it. And I got to talk to several of them. I was invited to a home, and we, they made a grass hat for me, and we drank out of coconuts. And I spent the remainder of that day sharing the peace of the gospel with Abdurman. Two different experiences. One fully armed, 20 years old. Never felt peace, even though I was surrounded by equipment and military might. And the second time, surrounded by God. 
I hope that you find peace today. And I hope that you're challenged with where peace comes from. I'm going to release to our campuses, and if you're online, I hope that you'll stick around and just kind of meditate on what's next in your challenge. Thanks for joining us today.